one of the the hallmarks of the tantric vision is that uh, that pleasure is is an intrinsic part of the universe, and and pleasure is is one of the qualities of the divine. You know, the divine is conscious of itself. It's you know, it has these abilities, the ability to know anything, to do anything, uh, you know, but especially the ability to enjoy, to enjoy every moment, every, every glimpse of life is experienced with sublime joy and love, with great pleasure. Uh, so, you know, the, a tantric, you know, it's kind of an outcropping of that understanding is that any moment of pleasure that we as humans experience can be traced to the divine because, because pleasure is intrinsic to us. Love is intrinsic to us. Awareness is intrinsic to us. These are, these are all facets of the diamond of divine consciousness. It, it loves, it enjoys, it knows, it sees, it acts, it creates, um, you know, it, it experiences uh, beauty. So, you know, the qualities that we call virtues or, you know, positive feelings are understood in this tradition to be intrinsic to the divine and therefore intrinsic to us because, because divinity is what we are at our core. I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and liberation. Today our guest is Sally Kempton. Sally teaches devotional contemplative tantra, an approach to practice that creates a fusion of knowing and loving. Known for her ability to transmit inner experience through transformative practices and contemplation, Sally has been practicing and teaching for 40 years. A disciple of the great Indian guru, Swami Muktananda, she spent 20 years as a teaching Swami in the Saraswati order of Indian monks. In her guru's ashram, she received a traditional training in yoga philosophy and practice and became a popular teacher, deeply versed in the teachings and practices of Vedanta and Kashmir Shaivism. In 2002, Sally began teaching independently. She now offers heart-to-heart -heart transmission in meditation and life practice through her Awakened Heart Tantra workshops, teleclasses, retreats, and trainings in applied spiritual philosophy. Her workshops and teleconferences courses integrate the wisdom of traditional yoga, Tantra, with the insights of contemporary evolutionary spirituality and cutting edge psychology. Sally is the author of Meditation for the Love of It and Awakening Shakti. I want to start with the beginnings. I mean, the late beginnings. I mean, not right when you were born, but would you share about your background in non-dual Shaiva Tantra and about the lineage itself? We're just going to jump right in. Okay. Um, so, um, just trying to figure out where the beginning is here. Um, I, I had an awakening in my late twenties and which led me on a fairly winding path that ended up um, in the, in the mid seventies, which was when I was just 30, uh, with Swami Moktananda, who became my guru. And uh, he was a tremendous lover of the non-dual Shaiva Tantra. So he created a small group of us who were, would study the Pratyabhigna Hridayam, which is a Sanskrit text. The name means the heart of the doctrine of recognition. The teaching is uh, the teaching of that text and of the, this particular branch of non-dual Shaivism that I was taught and trained in and now teach is that your essence, your consciousness is not different than the consciousness that manifested this entire universe. So it's, it's a full, and that the, the task of practice is to recognize 
that you hold divinity within you. And ultimately in the Shaiva tradition, the understanding is that when you are fully uh, liberated in this tradition, when you're fully enlightened in this tradition, that you actually recognize that you contain at least theoretically all the powers of the divine. And there are in that tradition, there are uh, stories, legends, and in my own experience, actual facts of enlightened beings who had extraordinary powers. It's one of the qualities of the non-dual Shaiva Tantra that, that there is a recognition that natural uh, qualities of consciousness come on board the closer you get to realizing your oneness with consciousness. So it is a characteristic of my tradition that, that in order to be understood as enlightened or liberated, uh, a teacher or a practitioner normally exhibits certain qualities of character, but also certain powers. Uh, one of which, at least in my guru's uh, lineage, is the ability to kindle awakened states in other people. So my guru was very, very uh, skilled is probably the wrong word, but uh, though he certainly was, but he was someone whom you could walk into the room with him uh, in, in an ordinary stress neurotic condition and within 15 minutes or half an hour, your consciousness would be uplifted to the point where many times in my experience, I would go from uh, you know, quite a degree of sort of normal human suffering to a state of total transcendent oneness and bliss just by being around him. So that's, that's one of the hallmarks of non-dual Shaivism is that it, it, create, it makes room for uh, the flow of grace, the flow of revelation to come to you through your connection to another being, uh, not necessarily a human being living on earth uh, because it's a very broad tradition, but the idea being that <clears throat> That, you know, that this quality of grace which runs through the universe can actually awaken you and you know, actually give you as a gift states that you have not necessarily fully earned through your own practice. So it's, it's a very um, kind of magical tradition in many ways. What you of course learn as you become more versed in it is that there is no such thing as a free lunch. So even though you may have profound experiences simply through grace or simply through transmission, you don't in general hold on to them unless you do, unless you have done or do, you know, in your current life, quite a lot of practice and personal transformation. So uh, it is a kind, so my tradition specializes in a kind of jump starting the spiritual journey. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, does not, uh, though it, it certainly feels magical when you experience that awakening, the, um, it, it takes a lot more effort than magic to, um, to make it a permanent station in your experience. So I hope that was somewhat helpful. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a great, uh, I, I have great honor for the beings in these, these siddha, as they're called, siddha meaning perfected being, these siddha traditions, which actually exist, you know, they, they exist all over the world, you know, that there are siddhas in, in Hindu-based traditions, in Tibetan Buddhist traditions, in other Buddhist traditions, certainly in Taoism. And I would say also in Christianity and uh, the, Judea, the, the Judaic mis, uh, mystical traditions, though I'm not as familiar with them as I am with the Eastern ones. I'm, I, I always like to get a little bit of oral history of, of people's teachers. You know, I'd actually love to hear a little bit more of Swami Muktananda before we kind of venture into other territory. Do you have any stories you'd be willing to share about 
both his humanity and divinity that made an impression on you? Like you were just sharing that kind of just being in his presence after a certain amount of time could uplift the dust of the mind and the being. <clears throat> well, he was um, extraordinarily charismatic. And uh, so he looked like, uh, to, to, my, to my eye, he looked a lot like Dizzy Gillespie. He was dark skinned. You couldn't really tell if he was Indian or African-American if you just looked at his picture. He wore dark glasses much of the time. Uh, in that when I first met him, he was unbelievably active. Uh, he was skilled in many, many things. Uh, you know, he, he, was, uh, he was a brilliant executive martial artist. Uh, he, he could get along with any, any, anybody. He had a very hot temper and an extraordinary amount of love. So uh, most of the stories that I remember because I've somewhat uh, purged my memory of, of uh, a lot of the stories that, um, that I used to regale myself with in time. Most of the stories that I remember have to do with my own experience. And uh, there was, there was a period in my early experience of him when I was in his ashram in India. I'd been there for, I guess, about a year. I think on that trip, we stayed a couple of years. And I was going through a very hard time, a kind of a purification, dark night, uh, you know, experience, which is a hallmark of spiritual practice at certain stages. And one night I had a dream <clears throat> in which he was, uh, I came in front of the, the temple in the ashram. He was sitting on the, the railing of the temple. He pulled me over, put my head on his lap and began rubbing the top of my head with oil. And, uh, and I woke up, my, my difficult mood, my, you know, my, my unhappiness had completely evaporated. And I was feeling very, very light, very ecstatic. I knew it had something to do with the dream. And I had had enough experiences of him creating a deep shift in my state through such means, through a dream, through a touch, uh, through a word. What was interesting about this was that it was permanent, you know, that certain, certain mental, um, certain forms of mental and imaginative and emotional unhappiness were just not there anymore. And about a year later, <clears throat> we were in Australia and uh, a, um, the father of one of his students had come to visit Swami Muktananda. And uh, they were talking about the son who, who, and, um, who was, had been having some emotional problems. And Muktananda said, well, you know, in India, people put oil on their heads and they don't have any mental problems. Now I'm sitting there listening to this, and I'm saying, "Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, you can you can definitely uh, work with psych psychiatric problems by putting oil on your head in a state of complete doubt and you know dismissal." And suddenly he turned to me. He said, "Take her case, for example. She used to have a terrible mind, then she started putting oil on her head, and now her mind is great." And I, he looked me in the eye. I realized, oh. Okay, <laughs> so that was how he was. You know, he was, um, he did extraordinary interventions often without you really knowing that he was doing them. And, um, and he, he was connected to anyone and on any level that he apparently, and I'm, you know, I, obviously I'm not in, I was, I was not inside his being, but my experience of him was that he, he could connect on an internal level to anyone he wanted to and, uh, and know them from inside. And it didn't necessarily mean, which is one of the you know, things that we often think about enlightened masters, it didn't necessarily mean that he knew your name, uh, though, though he did know mine, but he, that he knew your name, that he knew you know, anything about you, except what was needed at the moment for, you know, for freeing you from, you know, some emotional issue or opening you or awakening you. So he knew how to connect at that level. 
And so in that sense, um, there, my experience is that there are certain psychic powers that, that such beings have uh, that are simply part of the way they do their work. It's not that they, it's not that they're out there predicting the future or telling you, you know, what your mother had for breakfast yesterday, or though, you know, there, although there are stories, of course, about um, such displays, that really the, those powers are there for the sake of creating awakenings in disciples. And they're not necessarily even deliberate or conscious. So, you know, one of the characteristics of, at least in the tradition that I'm aware of, of an enlightened teacher or an enlightened being is that they are so in tune with the flow of reality that they don't have to think about blessing or they don't, you know, they don't have to think about uh, what to do or what to say because they're being, they're being led, they're being guided, they're being acted through by, this, by the, the cosmic forces in a way that is ultimately beneficial to whoever they come in contact with. So, you know, and there are many stories in the traditions, especially in the Sufi tradition, about uh, enlightened masters who do things that seem absolutely crazy and which the disciples later realized was an utterly necessary action that changed the circumstances for a human, for a person, for a region, et cetera. So it, you know, beings like this, uh, one, of the, one of the teachings that they give us, one of the, the transformative experiences that they give us is they, they give us a, an experiential recognition that the subtle realms, the subtle powers of this universe are prior to the physical world and can act upon and within the physical world, um, you know, in utterly transformative ways, according to laws that, that a, a, a purely materialist philosophy does not include. So, you know, a lot of this, of this tradition is very much about revealing how to recognize the subtle influences on our lives and on the physical world. And uh, once you understand that, you know, once you recognize that there's one thread of, uh, of reality that runs through everything, uh, it just changes your relationship to your own life, to everything around you. And it's very good in times as difficult as the ones we're in now to have some recognition that there's a level of reality in which things are being decided and taken care of, uh, you know, such that at some level, once you get this, you can relax about our future. So, so that's, that's, I hope that helps. Um, there's a lot that can be said about all these beings. No, I'm so glad to hear it from you. It's nice just to get the flavor and what you were just sharing about the subtle energy and this current that runs through all things. I mean, I just know even hearing that in my being, I feel these waves of, elation moving through. It's such a sense of relief and, and, and a sense of, you know, I, I do trust that all of us deep down understand that within us, there's some recognition of its validity as well. Well, certainly everyone who is drawn to the spiritual path uh, seems to have an innate intuition of it, but where that comes from, of course, could be lifetimes of practice or as you say, simply the built-in awareness that humans have when we remove the, the veils that hide that knowledge from us. Yeah. I know you lead practices from the Vijnana Bhairava. Um, yeah. And I'm curious just what makes this particular Tantra so unique? Well, the Vijnana Bhairava is essentially a meditation manual. So it, it consists of 112 verses, most of which are techniques, you know, so, and, and they're, that one of the, um, one of the assumptions of the Vignana Bhairava, which is the fundamental tantric assumption, is that because the divine is everywhere, it is also in the human body, 
it's also in the physical world. So rather than as some Eastern traditions and, and many mystical traditions say, you, you, have to, you have to get out of your humanness, you have to get into a transcendental awareness before you can actually experience the divine. Whereas the Vignana Bhairava, though it has many, many transcendent uh, um, meditation techniques, you know, I'll give you a couple of examples in a minute. Some of them, some of the techniques actually involve connecting to music, uh, connecting to the taste of food, connecting to your sexuality, uh, connecting to something beautiful that you see, uh, and, and then meditating on the, let's call it the, the core energetic dimension of that sensory experience. So, in other words, if it's, if it's music, for instance, that if, you know, if it's a piece of music that you lis you're listening to, the pleasure that you take in music, uh, which generally comes from being fully immersed in the sound, you can, you can use your immersion in sound to just open up your consciousness so that you realize that the sound itself is, is you know, opening up your inner body so that you, you become that sound or you, you know, and similarly with sexuality, which is of course the, you know, the big thing that people believe that Tantra is all about sacred sexuality. Well, Vignana Bhairava has a couple of, of practices involving sexuality and what they, they move you towards is having a full experience of the subtle bliss that is at the core of sexual arousal or sexual experience. And, you know, allowing yourself to just become one with that blissfulness. So in other words, you're, you're using sensual experiences with full honor for the sensuality itself, but to recognize what's behind them, what's, you know, what's within them, which is the bliss core or the love core that is at the heart of the universe, which is the fun, one of the fundamental tantric teachings. So the Vignana Bhairava is, you know, it's, it's, for instance, some of the transcendent practices that I especially love. There's one where you imagine that your head is the sky and you just, you just bring your awareness up into your head. Imagine that a vast sky has become your head and your consciousness will just naturally expand or, um, or following the breath. A lot of the Vignana Bhairava practices involve the breath. Uh, you know, following the breath through different chakras, um, bringing the Kundalini Shakti the, up from the base of the spine up to the crown, uh, breathing in and out through the heart and focusing on the space at the end of the inhalation, the end of the exhalation, allowing that space to expand. That it's a text that shows you that whatever you're doing, and you know, there are many more you know, so to speak, mundane, uh, mundane based meditation techniques, whatever you're doing, you can turn it into a meditation. You can, it can become a source of self-realization for you. And the Vignana Bhairava, which is a fairly early text, uh, most, most of the Shaiva Tantras are, let's say, um, they're not ancient, they're from the mid Middle Ages, they're medieval. Uh, so the Vignana Bhairava was, can be dated to the sixth or seventh century of the common era. Uh, it is, it happens to be one of the earliest of the recognized tantric texts. So and it's considered to have been revealed by, uh, by the guru of the tradition who is Shiva, the, the Indian God. Uh, and so it's a channeled text and, you know, it, it clearly came through the enlightened mind of a sage, but the tradition says that that in these texts, which are called revealed texts, the divine uh, sort of injects the teaching into the meditation of a an enlightened being, and that enlightened being then uh, records it and teaches it. So, at, at least that's my my interpretation of what a revealed text is: that it 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 does involve a human intermediary. So uh, there's some, you know, some traditions believe that, you know, like the Ten Commandments, they're just, 
they're just they just zapped into a stone or a rock. And there's some stories in the Shaiva Tantra lineage about teachings appearing in a rock. Uh, but I, you know, just I think it's actually from my own experience. I would say that uh, what they're probably talking about is an, a meditative download that came to a, to a sage that they then were able to share. I was actually going to ask you a question about the relationship between divine consciousness and pleasure. And it feels like you've brought a little bit of that in in describing uh, the senses. One of the, the hallmarks of the tantric vision is that uh, that pleasure is is an intrinsic part of the universe, and and pleasure is is one of the qualities of the divine. You know, the divine is conscious of itself. It's you know, it has these abilities: the ability to know anything, to do anything. Uh, you know, but especially the ability to enjoy, to enjoy every moment, every every glimpse of life is experienced with sublime joy and love with great pleasure. Uh, so, you know, the, a tantric, you know, kind of an outcropping of that understanding is that any moment of pleasure that we as humans experience can be traced to the divine because, because pleasure is intrinsic to us. Love is intrinsic to us. Awareness is intrinsic to us. These are, these are all, facets of the diamond of divine consciousness. It, it loves, it enjoys, it knows, it sees, it acts, it creates, um, you know, it, it experiences uh, beauty. So, you know, the qualities that we call virtues or, you know, positive feelings are understood in this tradition to be intrinsic to the divine and therefore intrinsic to us because, because divinity is what we are at our core. There's a tradition in Judaism, um, and the name is escaping me. I always want to say Mossad, but it's, it's, it starts with an M, it's not Mossad. It's, uh, and they, they see a hierarchy of pleasure, mm. now, which I don't fully agree with uh, their categories, but it's, it's an interesting way to look at pleasure, you know, that physical pleasure, uh, has a you know a particular characteristic, um, but beyond that is the pleasure of relationship. So you know when we love, we're willing to sacrifice physical comfort and physical pleasure for the sake of that deeper emotional feeling. And beyond that is the pleasure of you know of doing work that really engages us, or the pleasure of creativity. So they see a kind of hierarchy of pleasure with the pleasure of, you know, of divine experience of meditation and prayer, et cetera, being the highest level. Uh, in Tantra actually un understands that the, the divine pleasure runs through every, every aspect of every kind of pleasure. So physical pleasure can be experienced as divine pleasure. The pleasure of creativity can be experienced as divine pleasure. Uh, you just have to understand it that way. I remember hearing you talk about you pay off your debts by falling in love with somebody. Could you share just say more about that? Well, you this, you know, what that teach, particular teaching about karma, it runs through all the Eastern traditions, very strongly held in Buddhism, Hinduism, um, uh, early Christianity, early Christians actually had a version of the doctrine of karma. But I think what I said, uh, and it's a very interesting way of looking at your life, especially your romantic life, that, that when you are drawn to somebody, when you're attracted to somebody, when you're, you know, when you fall in love with somebody, almost invariably, you are being drawn together with that person because you have a karmic connection to them, which often includes a debt. So because karma means debt. <clears throat> so you fall in love with them kind of as a way of bringing you together so that you can complete the work you have to do, which could be having a family. You know, you're, you're, many couples are brought together and then they then obviously start a life, they have kids, they, you know, they, they, um, they carry on their family lineage. And 
very often in you know most couples will discover that 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 initial phase of infatuation, love, lust, whatever you call it, generally speaking, doesn't last that long. Um, it lasts long enough to get you kind of cemented to each other so that you can you know, do the task you have to do, which may be raising a family, maybe uh, some darker thing, or maybe a professional association of some kind. So <clears throat> that uh, it's attraction and aversion are, are, are pretty clear indicators of karma being at play in what's going on. I love the way you tell the story of the lovership between Sati and Shiva. Mm -hmm. Do you have any interest in, in bestowing the gift of that story? Of telling that story? Uh, sure. I mean, it's, it, it's a very famous story. And uh, there, it's told in several different ways. The traditional way that it's told uh, is in the traditional way that it's told, Shiva is the is the the main figure, the main deity, and Sati is a consort figure, a lesser figure. Uh, in the in the Shakta or the goddess oriented mythology, she's the center. So I'm going to tell you the goddess oriented version. So that so this that story goes that. Um, at a certain moment in deep time, that Shiva was uh, very, you know, was lost in meditation and his fellow deities, Brahma and Vishnu in the mythological tradition, decided that he needed to be brought out of meditation, engaged in the world. And so they, they, they petitioned the goddess, Kali Durga, the, you know, the great goddess who is an equal aspect of the divine in the in the uh, the tantric tradition and you know even in the yogic tradition, they they begged her to take a form, come into the world, and allure Shiva out of his meditation. So she agreed, and she agreed to be born as a human woman uh, in the house of one of the great um, sort of mythical father figures of or the early Hindu cosmology, who is a, a kind of demiurgic figure named Daksha. But she said, I will come into this body, but if at any time anyone fails to honor me as the goddess, I will immediately leave this world. So of course, everyone agrees. And she becomes the daughter of Daksha, who's a, uh, and at, and then there's a long sort of love story about how Shiva falls in love with her and they're married. Uh, and, you know, they have a very unconventional relationship because Shiva is an extremely unconventional deity. So, so they never have a house, you know, they, they live in the clouds, they live in subtle realms. And uh, at one point, Daksha, Sati's father, decides to have a, a huge ceremony to kind of cement the, um, the creation of the universe as an ongoing proposition. So he invites every subtle creature in the universe, in all the realms, every deity, every you know nature spirit, uh, every celestial musician. The only people he, the only beings he doesn't invite are Shiva and Sati, and uh, because he doesn't really, he doesn't approve of Shiva's lifestyle. Essentially, it's too unconventional for him. So when Sati finds out that her father has not invited her. To the, to the fire ceremony, she appears in the, at the fire ceremony and immolates herself in her yogic fire in front of all the denizens of the three worlds. Uh, Shiva then, Shiva finds out that Sati has done this um, and he then disrupts the sacrifice. It's, it becomes, it's a, one of the great mythic stories of, of the Indian tradition. Uh, and he then picks up Sati's body and begins to wander the worlds in his grief. So, and as he does, he you know, just all the cosmos is the planets are, uh, you know, tipping in their axes. And finally, the gods send uh, one of the planetary deities, Saturn, in fact, to cut apart Sati's body 
so that Shiva will let go of it. And this, the, the mythology says that her body fell in 52 places on the Indian subcontinent, each of which is an earth shrine to the goddess. Uh, and some of, the, some of them are very famous shrines like the shrine of Kamakya, which is one of the great goddess temples in, in India, but there are many others. Uh, so, so the idea is that these shrines, these temples are literally the body of the goddess and that India, uh, the subcontinent of India is, is actually created out of these sacred earth places that are, that are aspects of the divine feminine. It's quite a beautiful idea. And if you've ever been to India, you, you know that even in the midst of, you know, the, the, um, the modern upheavals, that there are still places in India where you, you feel this fundamental sacredness of that, of that land. I love that story. And I, I, I mean, the, the way I interpret it in the book um, is that this moment when the goddess leaves the world, she just is a moment when she's not being seen and understood by, by the patriarchal masculine. And, and I actually feel that this story, though it's not usually interpreted that way, really does hold that particular wisdom that in order, in order to hold the sacred in the world and the sacred being goddess, because that, you know, again, in the tantric tradition, uh, the, the divine masculine is, tr is transcendent, is not experienced in the physical world, except through connection to the Shakti, th through connection to the goddess. So if the goddess, if the divine feminine isn't honored, isn't respected, then it's very difficult for her to, to for, for us to realize the sacred in our physical lives because we actually need her help, her grace to experience how utterly entwined the sacred is with our bodies and minds. And if we don't honor her, uh, she doesn't, you know, we, we are closed to what she has to show us. And I, I feel that that's a tremendously important aspect of, you know, of reinterpreting the old mythology to, to be able to understand something of what was going on underneath. You know, it's so, um, you know, if we can look at, at the mythology of the traditions and through the lens of the feminine, either being disempowered or misunderstood or misrepresented, what is the moment when she comes back into her own? You know, because those moments when we can actually see God and goddess facing each other as equals and as equally part of every human being, you know, whatever our gender, uh, that's when we can begin to integrate the divine and the, you know, and the mundane in, within ourselves. You say more about that last piece. So how does it connect to integrating the divine and the, you know, the human? Um, well, the, the essence of, of that integration, at least in my understanding, is, is to have the recognition that every piece of you is an aspect of the divine. And some of those pieces get distorted, you know, just by the, the nature of being in a human body in a in a highly dualistic environment. Uh, so normally we, we try to integrate, for instance, let's say integrating our, let's, our darker emotions, our anger, our, uh, our jealousy, our, our greediness, all these, all these qualities which cause suffering in most people's lives. When, um, in order to truly integrate them, it's not enough to find out what you know, what happened in our childhood that we're still enraged about. Um, we also have to start to recognize that anger is a divine quality and that in its undistorted form, uh, you know, it's the way that we, uh, you know, for instance, it's the way that we draw boundaries. It's the way that we right wrongs. It's the way that we bring, you know, imbalance that we, um, you know, that, that we rebalance the cosmos. It sometimes just takes a very strong no to, um, 
to transform a difficult situation. And all of our negative qualities have a divine aspect, which if we can recognize non-duality, if we can recognize that everything, everything is connected to everything else, nothing is outside the circle, which is, which is a basic uh, shakta idea. It's a basic divine feminine idea. Somehow the masculinist traditions, uh, which have enormous strength and power, they tend to make this separation between the, the transcendent divine world and you know the messy, uh, you know screwed up, difficult physical world, and no question that the physical world is screwed up you know, and constantly in danger of blowing itself up in one way or another. Uh, but but it's not different from the transcendent. So to get that, to realize that that the transcendent is layered into the material is the teaching of the divine feminine. Uh, you know, because it's, it's, in, it's as the Shakti, as the creative uh, eros that brings worlds into existence, that the transcendent enacts universes. And the idea is that, that when a universe comes into existence, it, it hasn't lost its connection to the transcendent. It's, it's that the transcendent has become, you know, it is irradiated by the transcendent. So, you know, as in the gospel of St. Thomas, in this wonderful mysterious statement, break a rock and I am there. That's, that's the basic tantric idea. Who knew Jesus was a tantric? <laughs> So what, what would you say then would be some of the concrete differences between gods and goddesses? Well, in, um, so, so there, there are layers in these systems, you know, there's, there's the layer of the absolute, the, you know, the, let's call it the, the total transcendent God goddess realm, which is obviously beyond gender, you know, it's, it's beyond all form. And and that what and I, I'm speaking now from the Shaiva Tantra, the non-dual tantric tradition, the language on these, you know, I, I would say there are several traditions that hold this, you know, a comparable viewpoint, but I think the Shaiva Tantra is the one that articulates it most precisely. So that you know that the in Sanskrit they're called the Shiva Shiva Shakti Shiva, meaning the the pure awareness, awareness without an object, that is the, the highest level of, uh, of, you know, let's call it life, mind, existence. And, with, and within that shivaness is the quality of creativity, self-reflection and love, which are associated with, with the shakti, which at this level beyond gender, awareness and love are married, as it were, they're, they're, uh, they're undifferentiated. And in the process of manifesting a universe, the, the awareness is separated from the, the creativity and sort of remains as a, uh, you know, as a kind of beyond the world um, awareness that is very, very hard to reach. Whereas the the feminine, the, the creativity, the love aspect um, manifests universes, all of them holding at their core the pure awareness that the tradition calls Shiva, uh, but in mo mostly unable to recognize it. And what the, the, you know, the practice of, at, of sadhana does is, of course, transform your, your senses and your way of understanding yourself such that you can actually turn your attention inside and see through the veils of the physical, mental, emotional layers of yourself and see that all of these aspects of yourself exist on a continuum at the heart of which is this transcendent reality. So everything on the continuum is considered feminine or aspects of Shakti, which would include a masculine body. And at certain points, uh, the, these, 
these energies exist in the universe in forms, which are what we call deity deities. They are light forms that that you know that appear to have feminine forms or masculine forms, but they're really they're they're higher forms that we can contact in which in what in Western philosophy is called the imaginal realm. That is the subtle realm between the physical and the absolutely transcendent. Uh, and, you know, deities, subtle realms, all of these, these qualities of the, of the subtle world that we can't see with our physical eyes, but which we do experience through the eye of the heart or through the, you know, through the awakening of our subtle senses. Um, that, that gods and goddesses as figures that we can relate to and have personal relationships with exist along this continuum. They're, they're not the absolute, but they are, you know, they're, they're vortexes of energy and power and love that we can contact in meditation or, you know, through, through grace. Uh, and there are many, many such beings in the, in the, um, in the subtle realms, according to all the traditions, including what we call angels, you know, and other other forms of subtle beings who who are helpers who help us on our journey, and also some beings who are not so helpful. So, you know, so uh, in that wonderful Shakespeare phrase from Hamlet, there there's more in this this universe than is dreamt of in your philosophy. That's pretty much what the tantric and yogic texts say. There's a lot going on in this cosmos, and uh, and a lot of it goes on in this intermediate space between the purely physical, uh, you know, with its intellectual and emotional components, and the purely transcendent. You are an experimental meditator. Yes. What are you experimenting with? Any meditations at present? Any fresh ones? Um, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very much, and this isn't, this isn't new. This has been part of my teaching for a while. I'm very much about, uh, sh helping people open up the subtle body so that we can feel very fluid in the different layers of ourselves without getting them mixed up with our physical self. Uh, so I, I'm, I have taught for many years and continue to teach in somewhat different ways, meditations in which we take our attention from through the three main centers of the body, which you know, the, the center in the belly, the center in the heart, and the center that runs from the, uh, the middle of the head up beyond the head to the transcendent realms. And I tend to teach the, this as a, as a kind of vertical meditation where you, you begin by practicing with the mantra in the belly then with the breath then bringing it up to the heart then bringing it up to the head. And uh, it takes a little while to get the hang of it, but once you do, your, your relationship to your body, your relationship to all the different layers of yourself really opens up and you begin to recognize that first of all you're you're not your you know your individuality is not confined to the physical body it's actually much larger than the physical body and that at its edges your subtle being actually merges into the cosmos itself and you know what i've found is that is that the more we can meditate the more we can cultivate the experience of our subtle body, both within the physical body and around the physical body, the more comfortable we become in actually experiencing what I would call functional non-duality, recognizing that we can open up to, to feel our connectivity with everything and also maintain a, a distinct and discrete sense of our individuality. So not by but it, it depends on not identifying with the physical body, but rather including the physical body in a larger sense of the expanded subtle body. Uh, so most of my meditations these days are, are in are some form of subtle body meditation. 
And would you give any kind of practical advice for if somebody wants to deepen their meditation practice, do you have some essentials for people to really tend to within themselves, look for so they can, you know, receive the fruitional aspects of their meditation? Well, I, I would say the first thing is to find a practice that you enjoy. Uh, because for most of us, meditation is something we do over a period of time. And if we're doing it because there's pleasure in it, even from the beginning, it's more likely that we'll do it. So I'm, I'm just going to give some very foundational, um, I would say, I wouldn't call them requirements, but they really make a difference. Uh, one is um, to realize that especially when we're beginning, 15 or 20 minutes is not enough to start to experience real meditation. That you need to work your way up to at least half an hour, maybe even 45 minutes, because there's a moment when, you've, when you're sitting, when meditation naturally arises, when the, the meditative state will naturally arise. And when I say the meditative state arises, I mean that you find yourself uh, in, a, in a space where you're no longer so aware of your physical body. Uh, you're no longer so subject to your emotions. Thoughts may be coming up, but they're passing through. You don't, you're not stuck on them. Uh, and that, that's, that's the beginning of a meditative state, which you know, in the Yoga Sutra, for example, uh, the, the state of meditation is considered to be a state of unbroken concentration. In the tantric traditions, it's, it's actually the result of a shift out of, the, out of identification with the physical into identification with increasingly subtle aspects of yourself from identification with the, you know, with the subtle, um, feeling states, the felt states of, of subtlety, which might include awareness of mantra, of your body as mantra, awareness of your body as, uh, as the, the state that arises when the breath comes into the heart and begins to open the heart. And, you know, they're increasingly subtle states all the way up to pure identification with consciousness itself that, that are actually natural, that if you let yourself sit, sit long enough um, with your attention focused on, uh, on, on something like a mantra or something like your own consciousness or something like pure light in the body. So in other words, you focus on something that's kind of beyond the mundane uh, and, and just sit in it, bringing your mind back as much as possible. And eventually consciousness will expand because consciousness wants to expand. And the trick is, is to turn your attention backwards, as it were, into the body and then expand it from there. Uh, so almost all the techniques that I teach and most of the techniques that really work, so to speak, to create deeper meditation are based on that same principle. You, you turn your, your senses backward you know, interiorly into the body. And then you recognize that, that the state that you're, that you have, that you're, um, that you're opening up to is not confined to the body. So it's kind of a two stage, uh, it's kind of a two stage practice to deepen the meditation, but you, you, you basically have to be willing to sit there for a while. That's such great advice. Do you have a background in Dzogchen Buddhism? Is I've done a lot of it, but no, I, no, my ba I don't have a background in Dzogchen Buddhism. I'm a, I'm a bit of a dilettante on Dzogchen Buddhism, but well, I know I've done it. Well, then it's related because I was curious just if you, I'm always interested in people do many, many traditions and what, what parts of the tradition they find beneficial for their path of realization. You know, I would say that, that there's, there are some exquisitely significant spiritual truths that different traditions offer, you know, and Buddhism, for instance, or, or Tantric Buddhism, uh, you know, it sort of builds on the, 
the bodhisattva understanding of Mahayana Buddhism, the idea that, that we are here to, to benefit others, to awaken our own hearts, that we can benefit others. And, you know, and then in Dzogchen Buddhism, there's a, there's a, a series of very beautiful techniques for, for, for disambiguating pure awareness from the products of the mind. So I've found that both of those Buddhist ideas incredibly helpful and skillful. So I practice them. One of the things I love about, about Hindu traditions, mm-hmm. you know, and, and within the Indian tradition there, I, I would say every type of spiritual practice exists in the Indian tradition. Uh, the thing that is, I find very beautiful about, about it that, that resonates particularly with me is their, their understanding about devotion and the different layers of, and stages of devotion at, as a path, you know, it's as the, the traditions like Hinduism uh, or certain aspects of Hinduism, um, Christianity, Sufism, you know, they're very, very granular about the, the role of devotion of love in, in practice. And uh, I, you know, one of the reasons I'm not a Buddhist, although I probably in every, in every other way, uh, Buddhist by nature, is because the devotional aspect is not so emphasized in that tradition. Not that it's absent, you know, all the traditions have everything, but um, I'm, I'm a Hindu because, or, you know, not in Narendra Modi's sense, but I'm, I was drawn to a Hindu tradition because I have found that devotion and, and the whole, the whole, um, the panoply of skills that help you kindle the heart, open the heart, you know, find a devotional aspect to every part of your life, that th- these, are, these are what give the spiritual journey its juice, its rasa, its, um, its pleasure. You know, it really comes from, from having a second person relational um, experience of the divine, whether it's as an actual deity or, you know, as, as a garden or, you know, a, a redwood grove. I mean, there are so many ways in which you can experience devotion, but uh, I think it's, you know, the need for, for devotional love is a deep human need and it is one of the great paths to the divine. It's so beautiful and really resonates and excites me hearing you share that inspires. You're such a feast, Sally. You're, I, I could literally just bathe my being in everything you're saying. I thank you so much for all of your wisdom and generosity. Well, Olivia, thank you so much for what you're doing, for the work you're doing. It's a pleasure, a true pleasure. Do you want to share anything that you're doing these days for our audience? Uh, yeah, well, I'm, um, I'm about to start teaching a course in the books three and four of the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, which is the third in a series, but it's, it's one that you can engage even if you haven't done the first two. Um, it's a course really in the deeper stages of meditation and how you apply the skills of meditation to, you know, to discovering uh, things that you want to understand more deeply, to, to um, changing your own inner state. Uh, it's, the, 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 these, book, these chapters are very much at the heart of, of really what yoga teaches us about how to live better, uh, especially through meditative practice. And it's also about liberation in the yoga tradition. So, how, you know, what it is to experience yourself as, as the one consciousness that permeates this universe. So uh, that starts on January 13th, and you can find out about it on my website, sallykempton.com. Uh, and that's pretty much what I'm doing right now. So good. Well, thank yeah. you so much for continuing to teach and just continually offering so much. Well, thank you, Olivia. It's been a complete pleasure. May the year, the new year be better. <laughs> yes, yes, I concur. May it be better. May it always just be better. May it always be better. Always.